Hello and welcome to Cross Community Church. My name is Melanie and I'd like to welcome you to our online service. Whether this is your first time with us or you're here with us regularly, we are truly glad that you're joining us today. Our vision at Cross Community Church is to help people believe in Christ, belong to a church, and become disciples of Christ. If you're looking for a church family, CCC is a safe and great place to call home. And now, before we hear from our senior pastor, Randy Eaton, let's worship the Lord together. Good morning and happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's celebrate our Lord today and praise his name. Christ the
Thank you, Jesus. Wasn't it great to see that sunrise this morning on this beautiful Easter? It's a reminder every year that God is faithful and that Christ is risen from the dead. Not only is he alive, but he is our king, he is our Lord, he reigns forever. So let's worship him. Crowned him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul.
we thank you that you are alive that you are interceding for us right now at the throne of God that you reign forevermore we look forward to the day when we will see you face to face amen, amen. would you step out and greet somebody this morning look for some new faces say hello You all look amazing. Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Sunday. My name is Cody and I want to welcome you to Cross Community Church. If you are joining us for the first time, we are so glad that you are with us today. Can we please give our guests a big welcome? If you are new, we would love to get to know you, so please fill out an in-touch card, which can be found in the seat pocket in front of you. You can hold on to it and drop it off at the welcome desk after service for a free gift. This Tuesday, April the 19th at 6 p.m., we are holding a corporate night of prayer. This is an opportunity for everyone to come together, worship and pray for our church, our community, and our nation. Child care will be available for kids under the age of four, but you must sign up today. For our April local missions focus, we are partnering with our adopted school, Eisenhower Elementary. Cross Community will be providing coffee, donuts during the school staff appreciation this week. If you would like to support this outreach, please mark your donations for Adopt a School. For our global missions, we are highlighting Max and Debbie Thompson. The Thompsons are missionaries at the Phoebe Gray Orphanage in Liberia, Africa, where they serve 80 to 100 children. They also teach in the local Bible school and preach in their local church. Please keep the Thompsons in your prayers as they serve on the mission field. And to help us keep missions in mind every week, 
Dina and Kimmy worked so hard to create this missions map at the outreach center in the back. So let's appreciate them for all their hard work. Those are all the announcements for today. Please check your bulletin for all the details and the great things happening at Cross Community Church. Good morning, everyone. Our scripture this month comes from John 11. Can we read it together? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So these words were spoken to Jesus by, uh, to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, after Lazarus had just died. And the verse after this says that she responded by saying, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Won't we respond likewise today by saying, yes, Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of God. You are the resurrection and the life. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for his work on the cross. Sometimes it's hard for us to even describe the, the grandness and the magnitude of what he did on the cross. But to, to the best that we know how, and as your Holy Spirit allows, we describe it and proclaim it and we worship you for it. You are the resurrection and the life. We thank you for eternal life as we lean into you with all of our weight and trust in you with our lives. Father, we thank you for this service. May you receive all of it as an offering of praise, a sweet aroma unto you. And we pray that you continue sustaining this church as it proclaims your gospel faithfully and preaches your word faithfully. May you equip us and provide for our every need. In Jesus' holy and precious name. If you are able, would you stand with us again and let's continue to worship today.
Jesus. Praise you, Lord, Father God, for the gift of your Son. We submit ourselves to you. We recognize you as King and Lord. We bow before you today. Lord, speak to us from your word that we may be changed into your image. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. I want to say something to you that over 2 billion Christians globally have either said to one another or saying right now, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, this morning, I want to continue a series of messages entitled A Biblical View of Easter. Several weeks ago, I began a series of messages entitled Building a Biblical Worldview. And we've spoke about the importance of building a biblical worldview. And this morning, I think it would be very appropriate to examine scriptures, at least for a few moments, to understand what does the Bible have to say about Easter. A couple of days ago, I was in Publix grocery store with my wife, Dina, checking out on North Lake, and I'm always reading Time Magazine and People Magazine and U.S. News and World Report, and there was a magazine right in front of me, and the title of it was Easter, the Greatest Story That Is Ever Told. And uh, I bought that magazine, and I've been reading it profusely since that day, and I learned something that I didn't know. I learned that there are over 2 billion Christians right now. I try to keep a tab on that, but the population of the earth is expanding so rapidly. Over 2 billion Christians that believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And those are the Christians who are making the most significant impact in this world. And here's why. It's not just because of a cognitive belief that they have, not just some kind of mental assent that they've made and they're believing in a historical figure by the name of Jesus Christ. It is because Jesus Christ, who died on a cross, who was buried, who was raised on the third day, who ascended into heaven, who is at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us, who is coming again. This same Jesus lives within our hearts through the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, and he gives us the ability and the strength and the power to live for the glory of God. And the Bible tells us not only what it means to be a Christian, but what it is that we're supposed to do as Christians. Now, we have a choice this morning. We can think about Easter from a cultural perspective. I would suggest that not be the starting place of our inquiry. We can think about it from a political perspective, and I think that you know well enough that we don't need to begin with a political point of reference this morning. We could talk about it from a humanistic perspective, and we could dwell on the things that we think in our rational mind that Easter is all about, or we can turn to Scripture. I suggest we do the latter that we turn to the Bible this morning to a very familiar passage of Scripture. It is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In fact, there are 58 verses in 1 Corinthians 15. And aren't you glad I'm not going to preach through all of them? (laughs) Can someone give me an amen or an oh my? (laughs) I'm only going to look at a few. But 1 Corinthians 15 is the lengthiest chapter Excuse me, it is the lengthiest amount of material in the New Testament on Easter. Because, you know, Easter is about the death, burial, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Corinth was located on this tiny piece of property, this small piece of real estate that was tucked between northern and southern Greece, And Paul established this church on his second missionary journey. You can read about this in Acts chapter 18. He spent a lengthy amount of time in the city of Corinth, and he was preaching the gospel. 
and he was winning souls, and he was making disciples, and he was establishing a church. But you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Just like today, in the first century, the culture was encroaching on the church. And there began to be divisions and schisms in the church at Corinth. And there were all kinds of issues in this church. We don't have time to explore all of them this morning. We're going to look at the one that is most apropos for the topic at hand. And that is, there was a misunderstanding about the resurrection. This morning, when you leave here, I hope to accomplish two things. I hope I give you a reason for celebration. And two, I hope by the end of the message that you'll have an invitation to come to Christ for the first time for some of you, but for the rest of you to come to him once again, recognizing that he is the one that holds the kings to the kingdom. He holds the keys to the gates of heaven, and he is the one who holds your life in the palm of his hands. And today, as I think about what was going on in the church in the city of Corinth and the reason that Paul had to write this letter, I think how reasonable it would be for us this morning to once again look at these few verses and listen to what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth. I want to read this in your hearing, and I want you to give attention to the Word of God. Paul says this, Now I would remind you, brothers of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, and in which you currently stand. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Tucked away in those few verses are five statements that we need to grapple with this morning. If we're going to continue as a congregation building a biblical worldview, and if we want this morning to accomplish having a biblical view of Easter, we need to unpack this text and we need to let the statements that the Apostle Paul made about the resurrection somehow or another get into our thought process and get rooted way down deep in our heart because the reality is the devil does not want you to believe in the resurrection. The devil doesn't want you to believe that Jesus died for you. Friday night, we had a tremendous Good Friday service. And I shared something with the congregation. I want to share it with you this morning. Jesus didn't just die for you. He died instead of you. You and I were supposed to have been put on the cross. The cross was and is the most horrific means of death that the Roman world could have ever created, could have ever imagined. And Jesus Christ died on that cross in order to appease the holy wrath of God. To put it in New Testament language, in order to make atonement for the sins of humanity. The word atonement is something I encourage the young people in the 8 a.m. service to spend a lifetime studying. And I want to do the same to you this morning. Let the word atonement be something that you make a quest this morning to understand. I'm going to give you just this morning a covering of what it means. Atonement means that we have been reconciled with God, that our sins have been covered, that a price has been paid, that we now can be rescued, that we can be redeemed, that we can be in a right relationship with God. And this text tells us this morning, this first profound statement that Paul makes is about the atoning death of Jesus Christ. William Lane Craig is perhaps the leading Christian apologist at Talbot Theological Seminary located on the campus of Biola University in La Mirada, California. I was listening to him recently as he was at a university giving a question and answer forum. And you know, you got to be on your P's and Q's if you're willing to stand in front of a university student body and say, ask me whatever you want and I'll give you a biblical answer. And one of the students stood up and said, what does it mean to say that Jesus died for our sins? 
And William Lane Craig said, when I study the Bible and I recognize that all the Old Testament Jewish sacrificial system was inadequate to atone for the Israelites, and when the Bible makes it abundantly clear that only a perfect lamb slain before the foundation of the world, only a spotless, sinless, perfect lamb can atone for sin. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. In light of that reality, the only way we can understand this is to say that Christ had to die. And I'm glad this morning that Christ died for me. And I stand before you proclaiming to you that Christ died for you. And that when you embrace that by faith, you too will be saved. Some of you this morning I don't know. Many of you I don't know. Most of you I may not know. But I'm glad you're here today. I can assure you, you don't have to come back to Cross Community Church to go to heaven. But why would you even take a chance? <laughs> come back. Let this be your church. But let me make it abundantly clear coming to this church or any other church will not save you. Jesus died for you. And when you embrace that by faith, you too will be saved. And Paul explains that in his first statement, because the first statement that he makes about a biblical view of Easter is about the purpose of Jesus's death. I want to read this in your hearing, beginning again at verse 3. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Now, there's a lot of things in this life that are important to you and that are important to me. The way I treat my wife is important to me. It's important to God. The way I manage my money is important to God. It's important to me. Obeying the speed limit sometimes is important to me, depending on the context. Paying my taxes is important to me because that's something you have to do living in the United States of America. Paul could have dealt with all of that in this text, but he did not. He went to the very essence of what is important, and that is the soul of mankind. And he said, and I want you to notice this in the text, I'm not making this up. He said that Jesus Christ and his death is of the most importance. That's what the text says. I delivered to you what I received, that which was most important, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to Scripture. Now, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, let's put our thinking caps on for just a moment. I read a story recently about a woman who was in hospice and on her deathbed, and she summoned a priest to come and to pray, and he was telling her that he would forgive her sins, and she knew something was wrong. She said, let me see your hands, and the priest said, why do you want to see my hands? She said, I want to see your hands. He said, why do you want to see my hands? I want to see your hands. And finally, he showed her his hands. And she said, your hands have no nail scars in them. You cannot forgive me of my sins. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I can tell you how to be forgiven for your sins. But neither me nor any priest nor any religious leader can ever forgive you of your sins. Paul could not even give forgiveness of sins to the people at Corinth. And that is why he said, I want to share something with you. It's something that I'm preaching, Paul says, and it's of most importance, and that is that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture. I mentioned this the other night, but I want to remind you this morning. Five words were uttered in that verse of Scripture that are profound. Christ died for our sins. The first two are historical in nature. Did you know that atheists and agnostics will agree that a man named Jesus died on a cross? They will not deny that. You can't deny the historicity of a man named Jesus Christ. You can't. You would be insane if you did. And that's why agnostics and atheists and false religions and cults will all acknowledge it because you can't deny it. Paul says, I want to remind you of the historical event that Christ died. But then Paul reinforced and buttressed his argument by giving a theological point. He says Christ died historically and theologically here it is. He died for our sins. That is why the first statement is of 
essential importance if we're going to establish a biblical view of Easter. And the second one goes like this. The first statement spoke about the purpose. The second statement speaks about the plan. I want you to notice what Paul says. I reiterate it once again. His death, his burial, his resurrection was all according to scripture. That's what the Bible says. That's what this text teaches, that it is according to the plan of God. God didn't start wringing his hands in heaven thinking, well, you know, I chose Israel to be a light to the nations and they have dropped the ball, they haven't fulfilled their plan, and what am I going to do? I guess now I need to send Jesus to die for the sins. No, this has always been God's plan. The Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, before eternity, worked it out among themselves to offer a fallen sinful world a plan of redemption. We've already discovered the purpose, but the plan is something that the Bible talks about as well. I recently was looking at a book written by a professor at Palm Beach Atlantic University, Dr. Copen. He's written a number of books. Him and his brother are both prolific scholars and authors, and I'm so thankful for their ministry of apologetics at Palm Beach Atlantic University. And he's written a book, I would commend it to you. It's not an easy read, but it's a necessary read. The book is called, Is the God of the Old Testament a Moral Monster? And the whole thesis of the book is, no, the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. We tend to isolate the Old Testament as if it was something back for those people back yonder, and we don't ever need to think about it, we don't ever need to read it, we don't ever need to consider it. Well, that would be contrary to New Testament. Paul was quoting and referring to some passage in the Old Testament. There are hundreds of passages in the Old Testament that speak about the plan of redemption. I want to read one to you from Isaiah chapter 53. Some scholars believe that Paul may have had this passage of scripture in mind when he referred to the statement that he died according to scripture. This is a lengthy text, but you're not in a hurry this morning and neither am I. We need to make sure we get this right. So would you give me your ear for just a moment and would you please focus on this text? Because beginning in verse three of Isaiah 53, these are the words we read in the Bible. He was despised and rejected by men and men of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned, every one of us, to his own ways. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of his people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit found in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes offering for the guilt, he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, he shall, by, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted as righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and he makes intercession for the transgressors. There is one story of redemption woven through the tapestry of the Bible 
From Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation, the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament are not mutually exclusive. They are a coherent storyline telling the redemption of God in Christ toward mankind. This is the beauty of knowing the Bible. I would encourage you today to make it your highest priority to read the Bible. You will do what is important to you. And may I suggest to you that getting to know God should be your highest priority. And then Paul says this in this text. He gives us another statement. Not only a statement about a plan, not only a statement about purpose, but he gives us a statement about the proof. The proof of what? The proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, I want you to know what the text says in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 15. And he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Bible. Paul wanted to make it crystal clear that Christ was raised from the dead. But the question is, so what? I mean, if you read the Bible, there were people that were raised before Christ was raised from the dead. And if you know the Bible, you know that there were people raised after Jesus was raised from the dead. Here's why we mention it. Because when Christ was raised from the dead, he was raised to die no more. Lazarus was raised, but he died again. The widow in the Old Testament raised by the prophet was raised only to die again. But Jesus was raised in order to never die again. And when you and I die... If we should live until the coming of Christ, when he comes, our bodies are going to be instantaneously and miraculously transformed. But if the Lord delays his coming and we die, and we will, if he delays his coming, we will die. I know some of us don't like to think about that. I read a title of a book recently written by a cultural anthropologist by the name of Dr. Ernest Becker. He's deceased now. He was a Pulitzer Prize winner in 1973. And he wrote a book entitled, The Denial of Death. And the reason the title caught my attention was twofold. Number one, sometimes I wrestle with my own mortality. And you do too. The world seems to be in a perpetual state of denial. And thirdly, I wanted to think about the book because the guy who wrote it was a cultural anthropologist, someone who studied why cultures and societies develop certain values. Young people, listen very carefully. You have values. Right now you have values. You may not articulate it that way. You may not have written it out and you may not think about it, but you have values because you have right now a way in which you see the world. It's called a worldview. And there are certain values that underpin that worldview. This book, The Denial of Death, was written by a cultural anthropologist who, after looking at all of these people groups all over the world, realized what the Bible has always taught, that mankind is afraid to die. But the Bible gives us an antidote to the problem, and it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul gives us proof that Christ was raised from the dead. Did you know that according to Romans chapter 1, when Paul was raised from the dead, God declared him to be the Son of God by the Spirit of holiness when he raised Christ from the dead? In other words, God was saying, for all of you skeptics and all of those who are struggling with their belief, I just want you to know that the resurrection is my substantiation upon the life, the burial, the death, and the resurrection of this guy named Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, who is and always will be the Son of Man and the Son of God. The Apostle Paul says this is of most importance. Young people, I know that Snapchat and Twitter and whatever else that you're on, I'm on some of it too. That's not what's most important. If social media would have existed in the first century, the Apostle Paul would have been on it. And he would have been preaching and proclaiming the resurrection as the most important thing that we could ever understand. This is why Paul said, you know, I'm a Pharisee or I was one. 
and I have this proud Jewish heritage, and I have a strong education, educated at the feet of Gamilia. I was the who's who in the Jewish book of religious leaders. Paul says, but now that I know Christ, that stuff is of second place to me. All I need to know now is Christ who's been crucified and raised from the dead. That was his singular important mission in life, was to know him and to make him known. And this morning, we get the benefit of his letter to the church at Corinth, and we understand that he offered us proof. But there's another statement that we read in this text. It's a statement about the preaching that Paul manifested to the church at Corinth. I'm not going to read the whole passage to you again, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in three verses, the Apostle Paul mentions the word preaching twice. Preaching is from the Greek word keruso, and it simply means to proclaim. It means to herald. It means to speak on behalf of someone else. Now, in its original form, it meant to speak and to herald on behalf of a king, so his recipients would have understood his metaphor and play on words. And here's what the Apostle Paul is doing. Paul is saying, I'm speaking to you this morning on behalf of Jesus Christ. He is the one that appointed me as an apostle. He is the one that called me into ministry. So therefore, this morning, Paul says to the Corinthian church, I am speaking to you on behalf of Christ. And I am heralding or proclaiming the message that I received that is of utmost importance, and that is Christ died according to Scripture for our sins, and he is raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture. He said, I want to remind you of this great truth, brothers. I would say that today, in the 21st century, we need to be reminded of this great truth. Most of us don't think much about the resurrection. Most of us don't think much about the death and the burial and the ascension of Christ, his mediatorial role at the right hand of the Father, the reality that he's coming again. But how can we overlook this? This is at the essence of Christianity. This is at the bedrock of our beliefs. This, this is the framework that holds a biblical worldview together. No wonder Satan wants to destroy any type of a belief system in the atoning substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Satan and the demons of hell get very upset when churches are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there is no devil in hell that can come against the risen Messiah. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Brothers and sisters, place your faith in the risen Messiah. Live for him and worship him and honor him and Jesus will fight all of your battles. He said in this passage of scripture, this is the reason I'm preaching this to you because it is a message that will change your life. Long before my time, there was a man named John Lennon. Some of you are very familiar with him. The Beatles, part of the Beatles. And I was thinking the other day about the song that he penned, Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven, he said. It's easy if you try. That's what John Lennon said. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell beneath, above us only sky. Imagine all the people just living for today. That's where we are today. John Lennon was certainly no spiritual prophet, but somehow or another, he was a cultural prophet. He was able to capture the essence of the values of the people at that time, and it is that exponentially multiplied today. Just living for the day, making another dollar, being a little more secure financially, never thinking about where we're going. You know... <laughs> You got up this morning. I mean, I wore a suit today. I normally don't wear a suit. I prepared this suit. You prepare for vacation. You prepare for what's important to you, upcoming weddings. Do you ever prepare for death and the reality of eternity and the second coming of our Lord? He's coming in power, and we're going to hail that blessed hour. And we shall see the King when he comes. And when he comes, if you have 
placed your faith in him, your body is instantaneously going to be glorified. And before that happens, the dead in Christ are going to be raised from the dead. And their bodies that have deteriorated in the grave is going to be reunited with their soul. And we're going to be caught up together to be with the Lord. And we're going to be with him forever and ever and ever. That's why Paul says in this text that preaching does two things. Number one, it brings stability. And number two, it brings steadiness. Paul uses a different phrase. He says, and this is the message in which you stand and the message that saves you. There's three elements of salvation. Now, of course, when you place your faith in Christ, you're saved. But did you know the Bible tells us not only have we been saved, but that we are being saved and that one day we shall be saved? And that's all wrapped up in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you to listen to me every week. <clears throat> God has gifted the body of Christ with plenty of Bible teachers, and you can hear preaching, some of the best preaching in America, on Moody Radio and at your favorite television location. But it's really not about the adequacy or the inadequacy of the preacher. It's about the effectiveness and the efficiency of the message being preached. And the Apostle Paul admitted that he was not a good speaker, but he had a profound message. And the message was about Jesus Christ who died and who was raised from the dead. And brothers and sisters, if you don't get this right, you will never have stability or steadiness. But if you get it right, you'll be steady Eddie. <laughs> And you will be stable in every area of your life. That's what the Apostle Paul said. Not everybody's going to hear the message. I was reading this week about Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> you ought to read about him. Young people, can I issue you a challenge? Can I issue you a challenge that you would read about Jonathan Edwards over the next six months? Because by the time he was 13, God laid his hand upon this young man and sent him off to Princeton for a theological education. That was back when Princeton and Yale and Harvard were godly. Amen. They've drifted big time since then. But Jonathan Edwards is considered to be the greatest theological gift that God has ever given the Christian church in North America. And yet... The church that he pastored for years voted him out because they just couldn't stand to hear that you needed a savior, that you needed to be atoned for by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They voted him out. He didn't quit preaching. He kept proclaiming the truth of scripture. And Paul says in this passage of scripture, I'm gonna tell you one more time, Corinthian church, that you need to embrace this. There were many that weren't wanting to listen to Paul. They considered him to be a has-been. We don't need this stuff in our life. We've got the Corinthian culture. We've got our money. We've got our political status. We've got fame and we've got fortune. We've got our own sense of security. Paul says, I beg to differ. That's why I'm preaching to you, Paul says, about what is of most importance. Today, I want to suggest to you that what is most important not the only thing that is important, but what is most important, what is the bedrock of the building block of your life, what is the framework for your worldview, your biblical worldview, is the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension, and the return of Jesus Christ. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes a statement. And it is the fifth statement that I wanna share with you this morning. It is a statement that we're going to call the promise. Paul has spoken about the plan. He's spoken about the purpose. He's spoken about proof of the resurrection. He's spoken about why he's preaching. Now he just wants to talk about a promise. Something interesting is said in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. The apostle Paul wrote these words. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And this is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul has already built the argument that says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, go home, don't ever come back to church again. For those of you who are first time guests, we so welcome you here. But if Christ has not been raised from the dead, please don't come back. 
But if he has been raised from the dead and he has, you need to come back. You need to be part of a body of believers worshiping and adoring and growing in and witnessing to the resurrected Messiah. But this text says that this is the first fruits. You'll never understand first fruits until you understand it within the context of the Old Testament Jewish sacrificial system and the Old Testament law. In the Old Testament law, the Israelites were to bring a first fruits to the Lord, first fruit of their income. That's where I, we believe that we should tithe. It's the first fruit. If you're not tithing, you're not giving God the first fruit. You're giving him an offering, but not the first fruit. But Paul in this text isn't talking about tithing. He's talking about the resurrection. And he said, Jesus Christ is the first fruit for all those who have fallen asleep. In other words, Paul was saying two things. Listen very, very, very carefully. First fruits represents God's ownership. And it represents good things to come. Jesus says, when you believe in me, not only will you experience the resurrection from the dead, from the grave, but the good thing of heaven is on the horizon for all who believe. This is why Paul is giving this profound promise. And this is why we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, these words that Jesus gave to the family of Lazarus. He was speaking to Martha, and he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Because if you do, you have God's guarantee and Jesus' promise and the Holy Spirit's power to walk in utter confidence because Jesus Christ has destroyed death, hell, and the grave. And that is why, brothers and sisters, death is a promotion for the believer. It is something that we can anticipate as a promotion because we enter into the presence of our Lord. And then we read something in Job just to show you that this was taught in the Old Testament, beginning in verse 25 of Job 19. For I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has become thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold him and not another, even though my heart right now faints within me. Job knew something about difficulties and setbacks and problems and depression and anxiety and dealing with the ills of this world. But he said, I still know in the midst of that that my Redeemer lives. How does he know this? Because the Holy Spirit revealed to him the truth about the resurrection of the believer. So I want to leave you with two words this morning. Two words that I want you to take home. I mean, I hope you'll take everything else home. <laughs> but I want to leave you two words this morning. I'm going to leave you with the word celebration. When John was exiled to the island of Patmos, read it for yourself, Revelation 1, verse 17. God knew that, Paul, that John needed some encouragement. He was vanquished to the island of Patmos to die, to suffer. And yet the Bible says that Jesus showed up on the Lord's day and in the spirit and spoke to John. And John wrote it down for the churches in Asia Minor and God's preserved it for the church located here at 2575 Lone Pine Road. Listen very carefully because I'm gonna give you reasons to celebrate. Jesus appeared to John and said, I died, but I am alive forevermore. I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. And I hold the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Jesus Christ said, you don't have to fear anything. You don't have to fear the future. You don't have to fear the moment. You don't have to fear the guilt of the past. No guilt in life no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. 
celebration. The second word is invitation. Here's what I know the Bible says. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, he or she who confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they shall be saved. Not might be, not hope to be, they shall be. So here's my question to you this morning. Do you have the Spirit's witness in your heart that you are eternally secure? If you do not, embrace what I just gave you because it isn't the words of man. It is the words of God. And Jesus Christ said, I will meet you where you are. <laughs> Muhammad died on June the 8th, 632 AD at the age of 61 in Medina, Saudi Arabia. And everyone who's seeking him can just go to a tomb. Joseph Smith died Jan, uh, July, June 27, 1844 in Carthage, Illinois. And the Mormon church still celebrates him as their spiritual leader. Buddha died, scholars believe, in 400 BC. His ashes were scattered wherever they were scattered. Jesus Christ died on a cross. Scholars believe in 32 AD, the week of April the 11th, but the timing is not nearly as important as for the reason. In order to reconcile sinful man with God, he ascended into heaven. He poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and he takes ragtag people like me and you, and he gives them the offer of eternal life, and he puts the Holy Spirit within their heart and life so that they can live for his glory and honor and praise. And that is what we need to go on today as we leave this church. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, and amen. Would you raise your hands for the blessing? May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now unto him who is able to keep you, that's good news, brothers and sisters. He's able to keep you and to present you before his glorious throne without any sin, without any fear, without any guilt, without any condemnation. His name is Jesus. I said his name is Jesus. Son of God, Son of Man, Sinner, Savior, Spirit, Baptizer, and soon coming King. He is the one that you live for. He is the one that you love. He is the one that you adore. He is the one that you worship. He is the one that you serve. He is the one that you glorify. And he is the one that you're waiting to come again. And he is the one at his feet. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Can we give him an ovation of praise for his faithfulness to us? You can stay connected with us throughout the week on our website, crosscommunity.cc, and on our Facebook and Instagram pages. You can find us there at Cross Community Church. If you have a joy or a concern that you'd like us to pray for, please do not hesitate to reach out to us by phone or by email. We are here to serve you. We love you and we are praying for you. Thank you again for being with us today and have a wonderful week.